more than in Joshua's introduction, I wish he had brought the entire family here. Then we would have had more people on stage than probably in the entire auditorium room all day. Great to be back in Iowa, and thank you so much for enduring till the end. You know, I understand that I'm the last thing between you and leaving and going getting dinner. Uh, a little intimidating, to say the least. Not the first time I've stood between people and a meal. <laughs> Several years ago, I was governor, and every November we had reading week. And it was a great time. You know, the governor would always go to a school, read a story to children, try to encourage people to read. And that particular year, I was scheduled to go to the George Elementary School in Springdale, Arkansas, where I was going to read to some first graders. It was all set up. Early that morning, I'd gone to a junior high school science fair and watched kids do their experiments. And things were running a little late because, as you can imagine, the science fair kids wanted to tell me more about their projects than uh, we had time for. But I, I stayed and listened. It was fascinating. When it was over, we hurried in the car, got into George Elementary. The principal met me at the door. She was a little bit frantic because already uh, we were running behind schedule. So there she was with her hands ringing and said, hurry, let's go down to the room where you're supposed to read the story to the children. Down to the first grade room we went, and when I got there, all the kids were already seated around on the floor, right in front of the classroom, and they had one of those little first grade chairs for me. And I looked at it, I said, I know I can get in it, I'm not sure I can get out of it, but I'll go. And so I sat down in the little first grade chair, and they handed me the book that I was supposed to read to the children, and, uh, you know, I opened the book, and then I thought, I don't want to just burst right into the book. I need to break the ice with these kids and chat with them a minute. And when you're dealing with elementary kids, if you can just let them say anything, they will. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'll just see what's on their minds. And I said, well, before I read the story, would any of you like to share anything or ask me a question? Every hand went up. <laughs> and most of them were doing this. There was one little girl in the front row. And she wasn't just doing this. She was so adamant. I've never seen any energy like that out of a child. And I was watching her, and I thought, my gosh, she's on fire. I don't know what she wants to tell me. I'm assuming she wants to say, I just want you to know my mother thinks you're the greatest governor we've ever had. <laughs> but I saw, I'm going to ask these other kids first. So I asked a little boy, and he told me what he was you know, going to Asked for for Christmas, and some other kid wanted to tell me what Thanksgiving was going to be like. And this little girl was still old, get it. I thought, I'll just see how long she can last. So I asked every kid there. Well, I knew she could handle it. I mean, so I got, I got all the way to every other kid and finally got to her, and I said, Yes, sweetheart, what would you like to ask me? And I knew it was going to be profound. I knew it was going to be something very special. That kind of interest in posing the question. And so I said, yes, sweetheart. I later found out her name was Ashley. Awesome. I said, well, what's on your mind today? And she looked up at me and she said, Governor, we're already late for lunch. <laughs> you see, it was Wednesday and that was corn dog day at George Elementary. The fact that the governor of her state had traveled all the way to her corner of Arkansas to read her a story meant nothing to her. What mattered was, if I didn't hurry and get to that story, she might not get a corn dog, and the one she got might be cold. I gotta tell you, my staff ribbed me for a long time over Mr. Big Deal goes to school, and the kids care more about a corn dog than they do you. For a long time, they called me Governor Corn Dog. I told them I was going to fire every last one of them, but they didn't nip it in the bug right there. But I left there, and I thought about it many times since. I would to God that the only thing that little girl had to worry about ever in her life was whether or not she was going to get a corn dog, and would it be warm when she got it. But unfortunately, the America that she's growing up in today gives her a whole lot more to be concerned about than the temperature of a corn dog. We are living in some very dangerous times. And while I realize that many of us in this room are very focused and interested in politics, and as we should be, we need to be praying that there's more than just a political transition in this country. 
We need to be praying for a spiritual transformation in this country because what has to happen first in America is that we get our hearts right and then we'll get our politics right. It rarely works the other way around. In May of this year, my wife and I went to China for a trip that was celebrating our 40th wedding anniversary. And uh, thank you. <laughs> 40 years. She reminded me uh, that she's been happily married to me for three of those 40 years. <laughs> but as, as we went, I had some consternation about going because I really don't care much for the Chinese government, to be honest with you. I don't like the way they cheat and trade. I don't like the way that they abuse some of their people. I uh, particularly detest a long-time policy of one child and forced abortions. There are many, many reasons that it's easy to be unhappy with the government. But so many of my friends have told me that it's just a pretty stunning place where things are changing dramatically. And after we came back, I, I assessed that, that what was most disturbing was that China was becoming a lot more like the United States used to be. And America was becoming a whole lot more like China used to be. Well, there were some things for which I could be grateful for the fact I could say, well, you know, the Chinese have completely rewritten their history and taken out all the things that are pretty unpleasant. So their young people grow up without a clear history of who they are. As we were in Tiananmen Square, it was 25 years to the week when Tiananmen Square happened in the college student uprising. And I asked the young guy who was about 31 years old, I said, do you talk about what happened here? And she looked at me with this just bewildered look, and then I realized that in China, they have completely excised every mention of that uprising out of 1989 from their textbooks. It is illegal in China to mention it. And if you attempt to Google it, you'll find that you can't because it's not accessible. And I was saying to myself, I am so glad that I live in a country where we would never rewrite our own history until I remembered we have completely rewritten our history. We have failed to tell our young people how this country got its start. We've almost acted as if we are ashamed to say that there were incredibly brave men who got on their knees to pray and on their feet to fight, taking the muskets off their mantles, better suited for hunting varmints than it was to take on the British Army. But the British Army and the world they took on to establish freedom and liberty for their posterity, they did that out of great courage, but they did it with the hand and the providence of Almighty God. And I wonder, can you find a textbook in America that will remind you and tell you and inform you of what they believed, why they believed it, and the purpose for which they stood? Realize in China, they manipulate the media. You can't access YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter. Frankly, that may not be such a bad idea. <laughs> but I also thought that here's something else they do. They spy on their citizens. Boy, I'm glad our government would never do that for us, huh? Yeah, I lost my iPhone a few weeks ago and it really made me nervous. I have so much stuff on it, like you probably do. Names and addresses and all those emails that you've got phone directory, and I said, oh my goodness, if I can't find it, I, I'm going to be in a world of hurt. Then I suddenly calmed down, I realized everything's fine. I just called the NSA, and they told me exactly where my phone was. <laughs> Put everything back on it, things are fine. Our country's in trouble because we have failed to understand who we are, where we've come from, and therefore, we have no clue where we're going. And one of the reasons we're in trouble is because we're losing even the identity of what it means to be a country. Folks, I get on my knees and I thank God within the country that people are trying to break into rather than one they're trying to break out of. But what we also need to be concerned about is that this administration that we are currently living under is one that doesn't believe that there ought to be borders at all. I'm not anti-immigration, but I am anti-lawlessness. If you don't have a border, you don't have a country. And I realize that many of you have been challenged because you're
you're believers and somebody has said to you, but don't you think that as, as believers you should have compassion toward children? Absolutely. And I believe that we should, without any type of discrimination, show our love and attention and affection and care for any person who has a need, regardless of what their status may be. I get that as a believer. But I also believe in what Jesus said, render unto God the things that are God's and unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Our problem is not that believers aren't willing to minister carefully and lovingly to people who are hurting. Our problem is that we have a Caesar who will not do his job and who will not enforce our law. And folks, there is no obligation on the part of a government to disband its laws and ignore the fact that we need to know who's coming to this country, why they're coming, and to make sure that when they come, they're not coming for a nefarious purpose, but to join with us in building a great America, not to come and tell us how it ought to be. We're in a world of trouble today because we have rogue agencies like the Infernal Revenue Service, that criminal enterprise that operates with utter disregard and reckless contempt for the law that can target people who believe like you do and can do everything possible to use the full power of the government to step all over you. And what makes the sins of the IRS particularly egregious is that the IRS is the only agency in our federal system that can launch the investigation, conduct the investigation, conclude and have findings of the investigation, and then punish you as a result of it. All in one stop shop. What Americans resent most is the double standard. You have to keep your records for seven years or you will be guilty until you can somehow cough up those records and prove yourself innocent. Lois Lerner and her band can completely lose every email that would give evidence as to what they were doing and why they were doing it. And are you telling me that there's going to be no accountability to Lois Lerner and the other people at the IRS who have allowed themselves to break the law by not keeping the records? Folks, this is the stuff out of which deep-seated anger comes from the population of a country. And we have every right to be angry and to demand accountability from the government who would do that to us.
using the mechanism that was available to them, said to justices on your state Supreme Court that you're not so supreme after all. And God bless you and the family leader for leading that fight and exercising the will of the people. Yes, we're in a world of hurt for a whole lot of reasons, in part because we seem to have forgotten that God did not give his grace to this land and help us become an extraordinary power economically and militarily so that we can retreat from a position of leadership and become one of the most despised nations on the planet. I say, can you tell me, I've asked this question to many Obama supporters and Democrats, I ask it of you, can you name one country on this planet with whom we have a better relationship today than we did in January 2009 when this administration took office and Secretary of State Clinton pushed the reset button and President Obama told the Russian president that he could be more flexible after his re-election and he drew red lines that he knew he had no intention whatsoever of honoring. Can you name one country on this earth with whom we have a better relationship than we did before? And the answer is no, you can't because there isn't one. With all of our friends, they no longer trust us and our enemies no longer respect us and they certainly don't fear us. And today the world is a more dangerous place because of it. And today there are 40,000 believers who are sitting on top of a mountain in the Kurdish territory of Iraq without food or water. And the best we have is a C-130 driving over, flying over, dropping a few gallons of water and some MREs. If we had good sense, we would arm the Kurds as we said we would. We gave them nothing, not so much as a BB gun, not so much as a bean bag. And instead of those people, the only friends we've got in that region other than Israel, we've left them with their pants down around their ankles with nothing except a love for America and a will to fight for themselves. And instead of giving them the arms that would let them be free and save those people's lives, we do virtually nothing except stand back and watch ISIS use the weapons that we made and created against those very people. Where is the leadership in that? But I ask, where is the outrage in this country that we have not kept our promises to those Kurdish people? The government of Maliki in Iraq said he would take the weapons and he would see that the Kurds got them. But out of his corruption, nothing has been delivered to the Kurds. Nothing. And they stand there tonight, battling with little more and the hopes that America will once again be a nation that values people who love freedom and who love God. And why aren't we there? My first trip to Israel was in 1973. I was old, 17 years old. It was July 1973, 41 years ago, when I first visited that country. I've been back so many times, I lost count of how many. I was there in June, I'll probably be back in a few weeks. There's something I've noticed about the remarkable plan of Israel. There is no other nation on earth, bar none, that more accurately mirrors who we are in this country. We have not just an organizational relationship with Israel, but an organic relationship with Israel because both of our countries came as we had founders who escaped from the the galloping terror of tyranny and this were started in order to create religious freedom, liberty, and a sense of equality for all of its people. It is the only nation in that entire continent that guarantees the rights of women and does not oppress them and does not have a law that would allow for honor killing. It is the only nation in which people are valued and life is considered to be precious. And so how do we treat our friend? When they seek to defend themselves from the rockets fired from Hamas, a terrorist organization, not a state. I'm sorry, Jimmy Carter. It is not a government. It is not a state. It is a terrorist organization. That's all it is. And when they fire those rockets, and Israel happens to be pretty good at defending 
itself? Our nation's response is that we haven't seen enough dead Jews to make them happy because too many Palestinians have died because they were put in front of the rockets and the Israelis were protecting their people from the rockets. And somehow the best our government has is to create some ridiculous, irrational, insane view of moral equivalency and symmetry when, my friend, there is a difference between the good and the bad, the light and the dark, and our government seems not to know the difference between a Frank Catler film and a Quentin Tarantino film. We seem not to know the difference between that which is good and that which is bad, who the good guys are, who the bad guys are, and it's time we understand that there is such a thing called evil, and we must stand against it, stop it, and eradicate it, or else it will come after us.
that is that America might somehow quit believing that God hears prayers. And that we would think that politics alone can save this great country. But I assure you, my friend, it will take more than politicians, elections, and politics to do it. It will take people who humble themselves and pray, seek his face, turn from their wicked ways, and then 